Hello, beautiful people. So recently, Bernie Sanders was on the Joe Rogan podcast, and they got into kind of a heated debate about climate. So I just wanted to kind of go over what they talked about and what they were right or wrong about. Just as a disclaimer, not really going to get political here or anything. We're just going to kind of look at it from a data perspective, you know, regardless of what you think about either of these guys, I think it's interesting to talk about. So with that being said, uh, this is the article that Joe Rogan brought up that um, you know, he kind of used to push back against Bernie Sanders. So let's kind of see what it actually says. Scientists have captured Earth's climate over the last 485 million years. Here's the surprising place we stand now. And the authors of this were, I believe, a little bit surprised to find out that throughout the entire history of human existence, we've actually been in a very cold period relative to the last 500,000 years or so. So that's kind of where Joe Rogan started with, but I'm going to tell you where I think he was also wrong about some things too. So in an ambitious effort to understand the Earth's climate over the past 485 million years has revealed a history of wild shifts and far hotter temperatures than scientists previously realized, offering a reminder of how much change the planet has already endured and a warning about, a warning about the unprecedented rate of warming caused by humans. The timeline published Thursday in the journal Science is the most rigorous reconstruction of Earth's past temperature ever produced. They used over 150,000 pieces of fossil evidence and a bunch of climate models and to show the link between carbon dioxide and global temperatures. And this is crazy. So this is what really surprised me. At its hottest, the study actually suggests that Earth's temperature was at an average of 96.8 degrees Fahrenheit or 36 degrees Celsius, far higher than the historic uh, 58.96 or about 15 degrees Celsius that the planet hit last year. So, I mean, just put that into context. If the average temperature is 96.8 degrees, we're talking about no ice caps. We're probably talking about the equator just being scorched and darn near unlivable. And, you know, most people probably living near the poles or up in uh, mountain, more mountainous regions, just kind of wild to think about. Um, the revelations about Earth's scorching past are further reason for concern about modern climate change, said Emily Judd, who was the lead researcher from the University of Arizona and the Smithsonian. It illustrates the swift and dramatic temperature shifts were associated with many of the world's worst moments, such as the largest mass extinction that we know of right here, 250 million years ago, where Earth's temperature increased by more than 18 degrees in 50,000 years, 18 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. At no point during the nearly half billion years that Judd and her colleagues analyzed the Earth did it change as fast as it's changing now, she added. So that is important, and that's something where I think a lot of times people just see headlines. You know, nothing in this study actually kind of debunked anything about um, current climate change. So the timeline comes to almost all of the Fanner's Oak, the geologic era between the emergence of multicellular non-microscopic organisms and continues today. And I'm not going to read this entire article for you, but what I want to do is I want to get into kind of all the causes of global warming, uh, global climate change, some of the things that I think aren't considered, some of the reasons where maybe Joe Rogan was a little bit right. So let's get into it. So obviously our atmosphere and the gases in our atmosphere, such as um, carbon dioxide and um, methane, do make a huge difference in the warming of our planet. And actually water vapor is a huge one too. Um, However, two of the other things I just wanted to quickly mention today are Milankovitch cycles. And then I also wanted to mention just the actual solar output of our sun. Um, so Milankovitch cycles, though, they don't really explain current warming. And But let me just go over a brief overview of what they are first. Um, so they include the shape of the Earth's orbit, its eccentricity, right, which is this right here. So you see it will get more eccentric and less eccentric over periods of about 100,000 years. Then you have the axial precession, which is the wobble. This changes about every 26,000 years. And then about every 41,000 years, you have changes in obliquity or the tilt. And all of these affect how solar energy hits the Earth, how it's distributed around the Earth, et cetera, et cetera. So they can't explain all the climate change that's occurred over the past 2.5 million years or so. And more importantly, they cannot account for the current period of rapid warming. That's kind of what I was just talking about, because over 150,000 years, you're not going to see massive changes in even a 26,000 year cycle. Okay. Um, and they're just one factor that may contribute to climate change, both past and present. Even for ice ages, changes in the extent of ice sheets and atmospheric carbon dioxide have played important roles in driving the degree of temperature fluctuations over the last several million years. 
So this has to do with albedo. You know, ice sheets are lighter. They reflect more sunlight. So you get more ice sheets. They keep reflecting more. Um, and it, it continue, uh, makes a runaway cooling effect. And then similar thing, the oceans and forests are darker. So the less ice you have, the more solar energy the Earth absorbs. And that's how you can kind of have feedback loops that are for warming. So the extent of ice sheets, for example, affects how much of the sun's incoming energy is reflected by it. Um, and then there's carbon dioxide during the past glacial cycles. The concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere has fluctuated from about 180 parts per million to about 280 ppm as part of the Milankovitch cycle driven changes to Earth. And these fluctuations provided an important feedback to the total change in Earth's climate that took place during those cycles. But today we've gone from a 50% increase from 280 to 412 ppm, uh, an update to 421 in 2023. Scientists, so this is how scientists actually believe with a very high degree of certainty that carbon dioxide is the primary driving force due to human activities. And because they also do have a distinct fingerprint where we can, we can see what is coming from humans and what's coming from, you know, say forest fires or volcanoes or other natural inputs, right? So since 1850, Earth's global average temperature has increased by over one degree Celsius, 1.8 Fahrenheit. And recent scientific assessments show that Earth is expected to warm another half a degree Celsius as soon as 2030. Well, what's interesting, though, is according to Milankovitch cycles, I believe we should actually still be cooling. So, you know, I guess that's an interesting question I'd like to pose to you guys is, could we be actually stopping like an ice age from, you know, like kind of having a full glacial period where most of the Earth is covered in glaciers? Is it possible that we could be stopping that? temporarily could it be a good thing i don't know what do you think and i said do you think that a a hot earth or a cold earth would be better for humans and better for life in general um and then also let me know what you think about just the speed of things and you know if you think it's unprecedented or do you think you know people are just kind of full of crap let me know um and then the last thing i just wanted to talk about too was the 11 the all the different solar cycles so I have seen a lot of videos and I have seen people talk a lot about the 11 year solar cycle um, where the magnetic poles flip and you have an increase in um, sunspots and things like that. Um, but the sun also has other cycles that last longer, such as the Hale cycle and the Gleisberg cycle and the Seuss cycle. And there might even be longer hypothetical cycles that could let, you know, be like millennia long or something like that. So that is spelled right, by the way. Um, but yeah, so I, I always just was curious why, you know, the actual solar output of our sun isn't really discussed as much in the entire climate change discussion. And because I'm not going to get into it too much because I did do a whole video on it. But to me, it, it actually looks like our sun is kind of at the peak of the hail and the Seuss cycle. So we're peaking in like at least two cycles right now, probably. So maybe the sun is outputting more energy. But I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. But like I said, it is important to mention that our atmosphere and the gases in our atmosphere do make a massive, huge difference. OK, um, like I said, that's the reason why Venus is hotter than Mercury, even though it's uh, farther away from the sun. So modern humans appeared after 50 million years of falling temperatures that led to the coldest period recorded. So <laughs> we actually kind of appeared. It looks like at like the coldest period over the last 500 million years, according to this study. So this is one of the more sobering revelations of the research, Judd said. Life on Earth has endured climates far hotter than the one people are now creating through uh, planet warming emissions, but humans have evolved during the coldest epoch of the Phanerozoic when global average temperatures were as low as 11 degrees Celsius or 51.8 Fahrenheit. And then there's the call to climate change action. The planet has been heating up for the past 20,000 years, but humans caused emissions in recent centuries have pushed the rate of warming to unprecedented territory. Yeah, they took about a decade to do this when they're developing a new fossil hall for the National uh, National Museum of Natural History. So very interesting. I would encourage you guys to read these articles. I will link them for you. I'm not going to go through this entire and just read all of this for you. But like I said, just let me know what you think. And like I said, I would just always encourage you to read everything for yourself and draw your own conclusion. You know, I know that there's a a big distrust for institutions now. And, you know, that's fine if you don't trust people, but I would always caution you to not necessarily just 
always listen to people who are, I guess, selling conspiracies too. And sometimes conspiracies can be right, but you know, everybody has an interest. Everybody has some sort of reason why they want to tell you a certain side, especially if there's money to be made involved. So I said, that's why I always encourage people to just read for themselves, do your own research, draw your own conclusions and be smart, be a maverick. So I hope you, hope you all learned something great today and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks.